Hello, thank you so much for um, joining this event. My name is Haruko Nakamura, Librarian for Japanese Study at Yale. This is the second event of the special lecture series, East Asian Digital Collection, Digital Humanity, co-sponsored by the East Asia Library and the Council of East Asian Studies at Yale University. I'd like to acknowledge the uh, uh, generous funding support by the council, and I'm especially grateful for Stephanie Kim, the program coordinator for the council, for all the logistical uh, coordination of this event. Um, if you have questions, please uh, type your question um, in the uh, Q&A session, Q&A box. And also, uh, this event is being recorded and the uh, video will be available via the uh, CES uh, channel later. So today I am delighted to have uh, Dr. Asanobu Kitamoto for uh, today's talk, uh, leading, le leading Edo, Data-Driven Approaches for uh, Jap Japanese Studies. Dr. Kitamoto received his PhD in Electronic Engineering from the University of Tokyo. Currently, he is the director of the ROISDS Center for Open Data in the Humanities, and also a professor in digital content and uh, media sciences um, research division at the National Institute of Informatics, and the Graduate University for Advanced Study, Sokendai. Dr. Kitamoto has received numerous awards uh, such as the Jury Recommendation Award from uh, Japan Media Arts Festival, Yamashita Research Award from Information Processing Society of Japan, and the Best Paper Award from Jinmonkong uh, Symposium, and the Academic Award from the Japan Society for Digital Archive. Uh, please join me uh, welcoming Dr. Kitamoto. Yoroshikonegaishimasu. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so my name is Asanobu Kitamoto and director of Royce DS Center for Open Data and Humanities and professor of National Institute of Informatics. So as uh, Haruko-san uh, introduced, my original background is, is informatics or computer science, but I started digital humanities research uh, about 20 years ago. And recently my uh, main focus of research is uh, digital humanities. So I'd like to introduce today uh, our activities in CODH, especially in data-driven approaches for Japan studies. And uh, so reading Edo, we, we are working on Edo period data. Uh, so I'd like to introduce some of the projects that I am working on in the Edo period data. So uh, the Royce DS Center for Open Data and Humanities, uh, the acronym is CODH. So uh, you can access this URL to see what the, our activities. And basically what we are doing can be categorized into two. One is data-driven humanities, which is uh, focusing on innovation in humanities research using computer science technologies and tools. And another, category is humanities big data. So it is uh, focusing on innovation in non-humanities research using humanities data. So uh, today I will introduce uh, those two re research directions. And uh, so our center is called open data. So open science is the keyword in our center. So uh, open data is, is on, on about uh, open science is to make the research more open. And uh, so it's like uh, we are collaborating, uh, scholars and machines and citizens collaborate each other to expand the knowledge and increase the knowledge and deepen the knowledge. So this is what we are doing in CODH. And as open data represents, we, we release uh, many types of open data sets and this is available in this URL. So um, this pre-modern Japanese text, which is the uh, digitized books of uh, pre-modern Japanese uh, books, uh, which was originally digitized by National Institute of Japanese Literature. And we 
uh, host this data, uh, distribution of data in our, from our website. And we create uh, many derivative data sets from, from this uh, classical books like Edo Cooking Recipes, which is uh, uh, 103 egg dishes uh, uh, with uh, recipes with uh, recipes and uh, photographs created by uh, professional uh, cooking uh, researchers. So this is beautiful pictures and you can reproduce uh, the, the cooking by yourself. So, um, and also uh, when we started CODH, uh, National Institute of Judgment Literature uh, also started a big project called a network project. And the, the purpose of this project is to digitize 300,000 pre-modern Japanese books, which is uh, before 1868 or the Edo period. And they're digitized and released as open data. So uh, the advantage of open data it, is that anyone can use data for any purpose. Uh, only the requirement is to give attribution to National Institute of Japanese Literature. So uh, with this project, uh, Japanese culture finally entered into the big data era. So this is an appropriate time to start data-driven approaches to Japanese Japan studies. So I'd like to introduce some of the projects that we have been doing. And the first one is AI Kuzushi recognition from the data set to the app. And this project is a uh, collaborator is Tain Kalanuat, who was originally a uh, formerly a CODH researcher and now uh, is working on in Google Brain. So uh, the purpose, so the motivation of the research is this uh, digitization of the books. And uh, if, if you can see the books, uh, you can understand that Japanese knowledge over a thousand years is uh, recorded in, in the massive amount of books. So these are how to wear uh, makeup or how to fold 100 cranes using one piece of paper. Uh, we, we call it origami in Japanese and also how to build automata or robots in Edo period. So it's like, um, many kinds of knowledge that existed in the past is recorded in the books. So we would like to take advantage of the, this knowledge, uh, but the, the main problem, a, a, big, a, a big problem here is the characters that is recording the knowledge. So these are called kuzushiji, but uh, unfortunately, most of the Japanese people, uh, including me, cannot read these kuzushiji. So, uh, even if you digitize the books uh, and release it as, as open data, most people cannot take advantage of this knowledge in the books. So uh, the problem is that we have massive documents, but very few readers. And uh, some people estimate that we have 1 billion documents uh, still preserved in, in Japan before a period. So um, we have quite a large number of documents. And, but we have about 10,000 readers who, who can read fluently uh, Kuzushiji. So uh, this is quite an unbalanced situation. Uh, for example, in English, you have probably many documents, but many readers. So you can, uh, many people can read Kuzushi, the, the English characters. So you can, for example, ask the citizens to read uh, documents using a, uh, crowdsourcing or so on. But in, in, in Japanese uh, Kuzushi's documents, we have many, but we have few readers, so we cannot take advantage of these documents. So we think that um, AI or machine learning is a solution for to solve this problem. So uh, we created the Kuzushi's data set. And uh, well, this, this data set is created by National Liter Institute of Japanese Literature, and we curated this data set and releases as open data. So uh, as you can see, this is the collection of Kuzushiji character. Um, this is no uh, hiragana no uh, in uh, the collection of hiragana no. And uh, so for each character, we collected a character from many books and, uh, and, and uh, organize it by characters. And so 
the open data consists of character types, 4,328 character types, and uh, uh, we have more than 1 million character shapes. So uh, this is a quite large uh, data set. And if you can, uh, if you can load, download the zip file, uh, you can use it as training data for machine learning. And so you can develop AI accuracy recognition using this uh, training data. And so the release of data sets stimulated research on AI accuracy recognition, and uh, our group is one of them. So using this data set, we can uh, develop uh, AI accuracy recognition. Uh, but what kind of technology is useful for this problem? And we think that uh, the, the technology called object detection is useful for this, for this, uh, to solve this problem. And this object detection is developed in the, in the research field called computer vision. So it's basically uh, analyzing the image uh, using uh, algorithms. And especially object detection is a vibrant research area with industrial values such as autonomous driving. So if you can see this image, well, object detection algorithm can detect that this area, we have a car and we have a car, we have a car here and we have bicycle or we have traffic light and so on. So you can easily guess that this is very useful for autonomous driving. So many people are working on object detection algorithms. And so we have a very good algorithm for object detection. So the idea is that, can we apply this technology for Kuzushiji characters like, like this? And well, this is a simple idea. This sounds like to be a simple idea, but it was not possible before. And we tried it and, um, and unexpectedly successful result we get. So uh, the results, we developed a, a method called Kronet. It is a Kuzushiji recognition using deep learning method. And uh, so the, if you, well, you can see that there are Kuzushiji and uh, well, the Kuzushiji, you can, these are written uh, um, in a connected style. So, well, each character is not separated. Some, a few characters are sometimes connected. So it is not easy to divide into one character, but the, using Kuronet, you can, uh, detect the character like this. So this, this rectangle is called burning box. Uh, so you can see that, well, even, even the character is connected, they, it can divide into, well, for, for example, here, you can divide it into each character and then you recognize the character in the bounding box. So you can see that these are Unicode characters that is used uh, in the modern Japanese. So starting from a Kuzushiji character, you can first detect the bounding box and then uh, recognize characters. Uh, and so then we can read, and any Japanese can read uh, these characters. So, and we, we, it takes only one or two seconds for, to, to recognize all the characters in one image. So it is, is fast enough and accuracy is, is sometimes 95% for books with the best condition. So uh, even if we, we have some, some several uh, errors in one image, we can still understand that what is written in, in one page. So it is very helpful for Japanese to understand what is the, the content of the books. So this is an uh, example of AI acquisition recognition and uh, Mm, let's start. So uh, when you can see the chronic Kuzushi recognition service is here, and this is, I will explain later that this is called a triple F curation viewer. And if, if the books are distributed or delivered using triple IF, you can use this viewer and uh, specify the box that you want to recognize Kuzushiji. And you can, after that, you can move to uh, Kuzushi recognition service. And uh, in one, in a few seconds, you can see that the characters are recognized like this. So you can zoom in or zoom out and you can also change the location or the size of the characters 
uh, the location of the characters and so on, so that you can compare the modern character with the Kuzushi character, and then you can, uh, yes. And also you, you can have a Kronet text editor to specify the reading order of the characters. And after that, you can uh, out, output the text reading of, of, the, of the page. Yes. So then you can copy and paste this text into um, editor or so on. So you can take advantage of this text uh, service. So um, using this service, you can first capture the image and then and recognize and, and serialize. And finally, you get text. OK. So we developed Cronet, but we want to improve that we wanted to improve uh, the machine learning model to a uh, more higher performance. So we used uh, Kago, which is the largest AI competition platform. So we hope we held a competition called Kuzushiji Recognition in on Kago, and our competition was the first in the humanities domain. So we release data set and ask AI experts in the world to submit a good model for AI accuracy recognition. So uh, yeah, we also provide the prize money like this. And the period was from July to October, 2019. And uh, we had 293 teams uh, with 338 members and they submit uh, more than 2000 uh, submissions. So as a result of this uh, worldwide competition, uh, we get a very good model uh, from many people. And uh, the winner model called TASCJ team uh, looks like this. So if you give a Kuzushiji book, then they can detect the bounding box like this. And uh, it's um, the top accuracy was uh, uh, 95%. So this is quite uh, remarkable because while well, the characters are mixed with uh, figures, illustrations, but they can, uh, mostly they can detect the ca only characters, but not, not uh, illustrations like this. So even in a, under the quite complex layout, they can, the, the algorithm can detect the character safely. Uh, uh, with a quite high accuracy. And a remarkable point is that all winners do not read Kuzushiji, but have developed good machine learning models, so or good uh, AI Kuzushiji recognition models. So uh, just focusing on developing uh, AI Kuzushiji recognition, they don't need, uh, they need, they don't have to read Kuzushiji by human, the, the machines can read it. But the also the important point is that, well, the domain knowledge, we need to have a domain knowledge about Kuzushiji, what is, uh, how we can create a data set for machine learning. We need a very good domain knowledge. And so in other words, the, the domain knowledge was embedded in a data set. So the machine AI researchers do not have to have the domain knowledge of Kuzushiji. So, it's like open innovation. We ask people to, to develop uh, good AI models, and then we get these uh, AI models for wide use. And after this, uh, we started developing an app for AI acquisition recognition called Miwo. And so we, we also, we already released the uh, Cronet uh, uh, recognition service for three five images, but uh, well, sometimes it is more convenient if you can use your mobile phone to take a photograph and then definitely because she's in the photograph. It's more convenient and especially convenient if you if you need to study the material on site, move go somewhere and take a photograph and uh, study the document in the old house or old temple or so on. 
So this, the app is developed for that purpose. And uh, Miwo, the name of Miwo comes from the 14th chapter of the Tale of Genji Miwo Tsukushi, uh, referring to waterway signs. So this is the ukiyo-e uh, showing the, the Miwo Tsukushi. This, uh, this shape is, is Miwo Tsukushi. And so just as Miwo Tsukushi is a guide for boats in the sea, we aim to make our Miwo app as a guide for traveling the ocean of historical documents. So this is why we name it Miwo. Um, so this is a um, prototype app, prototype version, which is used at the Chemical Museum in April 2021. So you can see that, well, we have Biobu here and just take a photograph of Biobu and then Miwo app can recognize characters on the on the Biobu. So it doesn't have to be a very uh, a, a flat, flat book. It's like, um, you can just take a photograph and if it's a little uh, slanted, you can still uh, recognize characters on the, on the Biobu. So this is, you can see that uh, this is quite useful to, to recognize Kuzushiji uh, at, the, at the site. And now the Miwo app has this interface. The release version has this interface. So you can show a recognition result in characters or you can show a recognition result with bounding boxes like this. And you can also swipe to compare the original book and the recognition results. And also you can, well, sometimes AI has errors. So you can, you want to modify the recognition results. And we have this interface and also with reference to root characters uh, to, <clears throat> or also uh, see the database of Kuzushi characters and uh, then understand that, well, probably this is wrong and another one is correct. And finally, you can also uh, generate the text output from the recognition result. So you can copy and paste to another, uh, uh, another application so that you can use it for your research or for, for other purposes. So uh, we summarize the impact and future of Kuzushi recognition. So the Mio app was downloaded more than 42,000 times and more than 300,000 images were recognized since the release. And the daily uploaded images is constantly above 2,000 images. So this indicates that the app is used steadily and there's demand from the public to recognize Kuzushiji. And so we uh, released the app, but I think the future is that we want to develop the full text search engine of historical documents. Uh, like Google, Google or Google Books, you can search, type the word and search the books. And well, we don't have such full text search engine for historical documents of Japanese. And so we would like to develop this in a, in a few years. And we already have the name for this full text search engine. It's called Tsukushi. So it's like Mio and Tsukushi. So Tsukushi part is, would be useful for full text search engine. And I think, I believe that the full text search engine would be the driver of digital transformation in the humanities research, especially Japan studies, because full text search engine, you can, see the detail of the books and then starting starting from the detail you can expand the, the search so i think that this is a very uh, important um tool for uh digital transformation in the humanities research okay so i would like to move to, on to the next uh, topic uh, of about book and complete collection so uh, this collaborator is Kumiko Fujizane, uh, Professor Kumiko Fujizane in the National Institute of Japanese Literature. So um, we uh, talk about character recognition and uh, well, it's after character recognition, uh, recognition, you can analyze a text. But, um, and usually digital humanities people focus more on text because digital human humanities research, uh, they, they are quite, uh, <clears throat> uh, focusing on 
text interpretation or text uh, understanding or text uh, critical reading or so on. But in, in the digital humanities, we need to focus on non, also non-textual uh, materials like images and photographs and maps and uh, well, the character recognition or so on. So I'd like to emphasize that digital humanities is not only about text. And uh, so from now on, we introduced uh, how to deal with structured data or unstructured data. And unstructured data is includes a visual and spatial sources like photographs. It's, well, it's a pixel, uh, collection of pixel and the maps. Uh, it's also the uh, images or data, but it's uh, not text. So they require its own analysis and interpretation framework. So we are also working on developing this kind of framework for non-textual uh, sources. Um, so the Bukan, I would like to introduce the, the Bukan project, um, what we, which is about a non-textual or structured data project. And this is an example of Bukan book, which is published in 1789. Including included in the data set of pre-modern Japanese text. So you can see that, well, this is actually information about daimyo uh, in the Edo period. And this is a, a called crest uh, or kamo, um, is a symbol of a family. And also this is the name of the daimyo. And this also includes uh, when they go to Edo or then when they return to their home country, uh, home state or what they give to Bakufu or how, what kind of uh, tools they use for making uh, and as a symbol of the family or so on. And also these are the f uh, names of uh, important persons in, uh, in the daimyo family, uh, daimyo state. So this is a quite a structured data and the book is a kind of data book of daimyo and personal in the, the Bakufu. Um, so this has a rich kind of information. And an interesting point is that this Bukan book has been published for more than 200 years before 1867 until the end of the year period. So we have actually many versions of Bukan and, and also from several publishers. And also it's, it's a long set of books. Actually, it has been published for 200 years because it is important and long seller. And it's, it has practical usage, like it, it, some people use it as a souvenir from Edo city, or some people use it for seeing the daimyo gyoretsu, uh, procession of uh, daimyo uh, to the, that these tools uh, can be used to identify which family is, is working, so on. So, and because of the, the large demand, the frequency of updates had increased to a few times a month at the peak. So it, is, uh, it has, so if you compare a different version, you, you can identify that which part is updated from the previous version to the next. So this kind of fre frequency, frequent update of the information is also an interesting point of Bukam books. And from, from the book and books, you can create uh, some visualization or the structured uh, data, uh, like this is a Sankin Kota animation. Sankin Kota is that uh, Daimyo needs to move from the, their home country to Edo and back. Uh, you, they have to move back and forth because of the order of the book, Bakufu. So they, and uh, so it's the animation of when they move to Edo and when they leave Edo. So. And also this is uh, information extracted from the book and that it has uh, uh, some properties of daimyo, like how many rice uh, crop uh, they can produce or uh, where they live or so on. So this kind of uh, structured data can be created from book and books. Uh, but the problem is that, well, this is quite heavy work. And uh, as I said, uh, we have, books over 200 years. So how we can, how can we transcribe all of them? And um, well, it's, it's not realistic to transcribe all of them. So the solution is that, well, 
why not detect and transcribe the difference to create time series data? So we call it differential transcription because, well, if you compare this book and, and another book, you can see that, well, most of the part looks like the same, but some part, for example, this uh, family tree, the, this part is absent here. And this character is also here, but not here. So there's difference between the two versions. So you can probably identify the difference and then transcribe the updated part to create time series data. So, uh, well, the idea is that if you have text, you can easily compare the text A and text B and find difference. And there are many tools available for identifying the text based difference. But for, for using this text-based difference, we need to transcribe or we need to apply OCR to get text from the image and then compare. But this is not realistic for the book and books because some characters are difficult to read. And, and also we have a graphical element, which is not character like this. So the idea is that we develop an image-based or non-textual difference by directly comparing the images and find the difference. And unfortunately, there are no standard tools available for this purpose. And the traditional method is side-by-side -side comparison. So we, we put two images side-by-side -side and co compare by human eyes. But is there any uh, better way? So it's like visual comparison. And it's called find the difference game. So you, you can compare two images and I detect the difference. But this is quite difficult. And well, actually, it is difficult, so it is a game. So <coughs> not easy, but if you use, if you can take advantage of uh, the, the computer, computer can overlay two images and, and uh, emphasize the difference. And then you can easily identify that, well, this part is different, this part is different, this part, this part, those parts are different. So. It's not difficult. So it's not a game. It's, 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 it's an easy game for computers. So the important point is that for humans, visual comparison requires an effort comparable to playing games. It's not, it's difficult. But for machines, visual comparison is an easy game using computer vision-based image matching algorithm. So um, let's turn a difficult task, reading difference into an easy one with the help of machines. So if we pr provide uh, humans with this figure, humans can easily identify that well, this part is diff different. So instead of showing these two images, we, we create this image and show, show it to humans and then they can identify the difference. So we call it differential reading. So it's a new mode of reading books focusing on difference between editions or versions. And we released a service called Image Collation for Differential Reading on, on this URL. So it, we developed a JavaScript based to relief.js for comparing images. And for on this website, you, anyone can upload two images or specify URLs, and the system can automatically match two images and decide the difference. And when the system fails, you can manually improve the matching. So, uh, and, uh, this, this Genji Hakuni issue comparison, this is not released by us, but uh, it's released from the University of Tokyo Library. And they compare uh, Genji Hakuni issue images from two different libraries and compare them on the vdif.js that we provide. And then they, under, they notice that there's difference on this part, but the characters are the same, but only the facial part is, has difference. So we don't know why they, are different, but it is an interesting observation. And it is not easy to, to notice by humans by just comparing side by side, but overlaying two images, you can easily identify that, well, there is actually difference. So why there's difference? It is a new research question that to ask for and uh, study more about how the books are created and so on. And uh, this image, a collection service is for two images, but for the bookan, 
we want to compare books or book collection. So we develop a system for book collection uh, and a large scale book collection. collection. So <clears throat> I like briefly introduce how we do this. And it's it's consists of page collection, book collection, and book tracking. The first part is page collection. So we compare two images and overlay two images using key point matching. And key point, I don't go into the detail about the algorithm, but basically we detect the key points like this, which is kind of has a unique uh, intensity change in a, in a small region. And then com compare two images that has the similar key points and then make a correspondence between key points and then compute how we can overlay two images with a minimum error. So this using this algorithm, you can compare two images. And also in a book level, we, we compare book uh, each page from book A and then each page from book B and uh, see that how many key points we can make, make a matching. And then we can order by score and apply the stable ma marriage algorithm to find the best match. So stable marriage algorithm basically have a preference. Uh, it, it's originally developed for the uh, optimal uh, marriage between the men and women. And uh, the requirement is that each man and women has a preference order that this, this uh, lady A has preference on three, five to um, four men and so on. So if we define this preference order, then we can find the uh, best uh, matching and uh, best marriage. Uh, so we, we apply this algorithm for making a best match between book N and book B. So uh, this is an example of a, a page by page collation. So you can see that what well, this part uh, is Red is from the, this book published in 1791, and the blue part is from the 1789. So they're two years apart. And, and, and you can see that some parts are missing in uh, book B, uh, blue book, and some parts are missing uh, in red book. And you can easily identify that uh, this, which part is updated in two versions. And also you can have one image showing a di difference easily uh, by uh, using red and blue color. And if, if the matching is not good, then you can change uh, in real time the, how uh, we improve the matching between two images. So uh, after this, we can tr keep tracking of the wood block across time. So for example, this book is published in 1889 and this book is published in 1841. So uh, it's the difference, but you can overlay two images and then compare the difference. So the same woodblock can be tracked to analyze the evolution of information on the woodblock. And this is useful for uh, differential transcription to identify the difference and then transcribe that part. Okay, so we move to the third part, uh, Kaokore and Triple F creation platform. And this collaborator is Chikai Suzuki and Jun Homa and Intao Tian uh, from Google Brain. So I'd like to introduce the Triple IF, uh, which is maybe some of you uh, have already known the, the Triple IF, but uh, this Triple IF is called International Image Interoperability Framework. And um, well, to understand easily, I sometimes say that on the web, you have HTML. And if you create HTML page, you can have many trip, uh, web service, one, two, three. And you can, if you use the uh, web browser, you can see all the web service using one viewer, uh, one browser, and you have a uh, several browsers like Chrome and Edge and Firefox and so on. But using an, another uh, different browser, you can use this web service everywhere using the same browser. So Triple F is, is 
HTML for images. So you have many TripIF services in the world, and you have a few uh, TripIF viewer. But if you have used one TripIF viewer, then you can see any TripIF service using one viewer. So uh, I introduced uh, some of the uh, information about TripIF in this uh, COD seminar. But this is, uh, yes, you can understand that this is images. Uh, TripIF is like web in uh, HTML in the web. And we are interested in using TripIF for curation. And curation is a word that originally means activities of museums, such as collecting materials and exhibiting artworks. So we, if we have, um, so it's like a process of collecting materials under a certain theme and arrange them in an appropriate order or layout and present or share the result as a new material. So this is a step of curation. And if we want to create a curation like uh, the collection of faces in the analog uh, age, we need to take a photograph or copy the material and using scissors to crop the part and use the glue to collect them in a new as a new collection. So it is a very time consuming work in the analog world. But in a digital world, you can create a collection quite easily using TripIF Curation Viewer, which is developed by COD since 2016. So you can read a TripIF image and you can first use this uh, rectangle button, crop button to select the region and then use the star favorite button to in input into curation, to collect into curation. So if you read new TripIF images and crop the region and then add to curation. And by doing this, you can create your own collection of images from the as a part of image. So using this approach, we created a collection of facial expressions or kao kore. Uh, kao is a face and kore is a collection. So <coughs> we did it as a new data set for facial expressions. So using TripIF Creation Viewer for cropping and collecting apart images, and we use another tool called TripIF Creation Finder for searching the collection by metadata. Like this is a, a, a image of warriors, which is added as a metadata of these books, uh, these images. And uh, finally, we use TripIF Creation Board for analyzing the collection for art history research uh, in the digital humanities uh, research. So uh, this T5 curation board, you can, well, first we, we uh, you create, uh, use a T5 curation viewer to crop the, the regions and use, create a cow core collection, and then use T5 curation board to uh, <clears throat> organize images in on two, di two dimensional board. And you can place, for example, these, um, a sheet mat or to make a grouping or add a stamp to add another uh, more a smaller uh, groupings of the, the images and so on. So you can move these images to another group or so on so that uh, th th these are actually uh, the, the criteria of uh, using art history research that how to study this book. And you can, because th this is triple IVF, you can any time, go back to the original image to understand the, in which context the, 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 this face appears. So it's like you can go, you can first study the detail of the face and then return to the, uh, uh, the macro scale uh, analysis, use, including the context of the face. And we also developed a face detection uh, by machine learning, which is similar to uh, the Kudushiji character. So uh, the same technology can be applied to face detection in, in the artwork. And these are <coughs> the, uh, the algorithm successfully uh, uh, detected the faces in artworks learned from the Kaokure dataset. 
So this is uh, like ML a machine learning assisted annotation. So it's like learning from the calculator data set about 80% of the faces will automatically detected. And it, we apply it, this technology to uh, new artworks. It's still uh, detected in 70% of the faces. So it means that two thirds of the faces can be automatically detected. So the amount of work by humans is reduced to one third. Then art historians can analyze more data and more data leads to richer evidence and higher reliability of the results. So it's like uh, using machine learning and create a new data set. This is useful for expanding the, the data set size and uh, useful for art history research. And another technology for face detection is used to create ukiyo-e faces data set which is uh, created by uh, Intel Tian from Google Brain. And uh, it, well, the original image is from Art Research Center of Ritzmaker University. And uh, well, it's, it's a ukiyo-e uh, um, and kabuki player, and it may, mostly kabuki player and uh, kabuki player faces are extracted and, and organized by the author of the big paintings. So you can, it is released as a new data set for visual QA research. Okay, the final topic is Edo Maps, Edo Me, and Historical Big Data, and the collaborator is Chikaiko Suzuki and Mika Ichino. So this is Edo Maps uh, beta. Uh, we, uh, this Edo Map is actually created by the, at the end of Edo period, and uh, it is it, a very detailed map with a, with a town name and the streets and the uh, canals and so on. So uh, there are many place names. And so from 29 sheets, we extracted 80,719 place names and to create a database of place names in the Edo city. So we create, <coughs> uh, we explain how we created the map. So the original image is, is uh, released from the digital collection of National Diet Library of Japan uh, as a triple IF image. So using triple IF, you can add value by annotating information without copying original images. So you, you can overlay the annotation, like, well, this place, we have this uh, name and this place this has name like this. So uh, read the image on the triple IF creation viewer, draw a rectangle to record the coordinate and then transcribe characters inside the rectangle and save them using the triple IF creation format. Using this approach, we can create a database of place names with the coordinate on the map. But uh, if you use the maps, we will also want to know the uh, coordinate of the current on the current map or in another word, latitude and longitude of the place. So as you can see that, well, this map is not like uh, the current map. It's, it's distorted and north is not uh, on up. So we use the uh, Ritsumeka University map warp of Japanese and uh, add a, a correspondence of GCP, ground control point, that this point is this point on the map or so. Then we use this to make a georeference of the maps. So uh, repeat this process for 29 maps. Well, we understand that the, the, those Edo Kiriyas map uh, is covering this area of the Tokyo, current Tokyo. And uh, the extractive place names are like this. So we have cities, residents, temples and shrines, shopping sites, place names, town names, what area sites, things, both others. There are many other place names that are not transcribed, especially the uh, the name of the Baku, <coughs> Bakufu people, which is quite large. So uh, we on, only extracted some of the place names <coughs> in the in the maps, but it is useful for identifying that uh, important place names in the Edo city. And uh, after your referencing, we can overlay. Uh, previous old maps on the current map using Google Earth. And you can see that, well, this is the Tokyo city, uh, Station and this is Imperial Palace. 
uh, the Imperial Palace is previously uh, Edo Castle, and also the canals are now, some of the canals are turned into the road now, but still the, the road in the Edo period is still used as a road in the modern uh, city, and it is interesting to see this. And the Edo maps can be used and in this way, you can see the list of Edo maps, and then you can see uh, the the <coughs> the map uh, with a marker on the with a name transcribed uh, text. So you can, if you can click, you can see that. But this part, this point is like this, and so on. You, we also use the Trip Articulation Viewer to visualize the this the old map as a kind of web map. And you can also see the information for each individual place names. And after that, we create, a, a, we use a GOLOD, which is a, a system to give an identifier for toponyms or place names. So each place name has a unique identifier. And so, and the GeoLOD has a is a database to have a unique identifier and also the name and latitude and longitude e e extracted from the georeference map. So uh, using this uh, GeoLOD ID identifier, we can specify the place name across the different um, applications. And <coughs> for example, we created the Edo sightseeing guide. Uh, we selected two tribal guidebooks for each century and used Trip Creation Bureau to crop pictorial parts and added metadata by transcription. So, and assigned GeoLOD and other identifiers. So, this is an um, image of Asakusa. And uh, yes, you, we give an identifier, GeoLOD identifier to Asak uh, this image. So, we can use this image in another application to show the image of Asakusa. We also created the Edo shopping guide, and uh, yes, it's like the database of shopping guidebooks published in 1824. And yeah, we classify the type of merchant's business according to this classification system and assign GeoLOD and other identifiers. So we can know that this, this is a place of the shops, and then we know that which area we have uh, this kind of food uh, wholesale shops and so on. And now those information is integrated into Edomi data portal for the historical Edo. And uh, so we can visualize that where the distribution of the shops and uh, sightseeing spots on the current map. So it's like uh, looking back the history. So we, uh, well, the, the, for the example, shopping guide, we created the type classification of the business using the current Japan standard industrial classification. So then we know that, well, we have many medicine shops and household hardware and so on. So uh, we can easily understand that how the business uh, distribution is worthy in the period. And the reason of doing this is that, well, we believe that the general public wants to look back the history from the present. So it is easier to understand using the current uh, classification scheme. And well, we know that experts try to understand the past as it was. So they try to study the material as it was, but uh, we would like to link the past from the present to, uh, to understand for the general public to understand uh, more easily. So a uh, similar idea is actually explored in the Europe called Time Machine Europe project, and they call it big data of the past. So uh, they create a machine readable data of the past using AI and simulation and developing new critical reflections of the past and the future. So it's like uh, we uh, want to create a big data of the past and then connect it with the present and then extend it to the future 
And I think that is the very important direction of the future research. So we are working on historical big data project. It's like creating a structured data from uh, historical sources on the na na nature data and cultural data, including weather, earthquake, eruption, disease, uh, economy, population, politics, and culture. And this is very uh, extracting uh, information on the past and use it for the present and the future. So <clears throat> uh, well, the key point is data structure workflow, starting from handwritten characters to digital image and plain text and by transcription and by markup to semi-structured data. But then we also want to analyze with the uh, current um, word like uh, latitude and longitude. So we would like to make a mapping between the uh, document space and entity space. I, I don't have time to explain the details. So uh, just to show the, the figure, but the uh, important point is that we, we, we like to create link, make a link between the document and the, and the word. So this is a summary of uh, today's talk. Uh, we uh, introduced the data-driven approaches for Japan studies. So the first project is AI acquisition recognition. It illustrates how machine learning project can be studied and developed into the real world uh, application. And book on complete collection shows how the idea of differential reading can reduce the burden of humans. And the uh, third one, Kaokore, demonstrates that how interoperability such as Triple F plays a critical role in the digital humanities platform. And uh, finally, the Edo maps and historical big data explores the possibilities for linking the past, present, and the future. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, if you are interested, visit our website and also collaboration is welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kitamoto. Um, it was very informative and I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I have, uh, myself, I have a question, but we only have like, uh, very few minutes and I'm thinking I mean, the, uh, if any of you who wants to stay a little longer, I'm gonna extend uh, this event for five minutes. So if you have um, any question, please do uh, type in your question. And also the, um, actually I think there's a function you can raise hand to ask if you, uh, if you don't wanna type. But um, somebody asked, uh, one person asked about if it's recording is available. And yes, it is. Um, uh, fortunately, we were able to get uh, this recording. So we will make it, uh, uh, make it available through the uh, Council of East Asia, East Asia Studies um, at the Yale's channel. Um, so it's going to take a little longer, little well, two, week, two weeks maybe, uh, but they do will be available. Um, oh, there's no function, sorry. There's no function for raising hands. So you have to, sorry, you have to type in a uh, um, um, uh, question. Oh, and then now we have, we got one question. Is there any question you have? Please let me know. Um, uh, okay, I have one question. Um, okay, so one question is from John, uh, John D'Amico. Uh, thanks for the very informative presentation. Will it be possible to train the MIO model on other data sets, groups of manuscripts? Okay, uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, well, this is not currently possible, but uh, in the future, we would like to uh, add a new data from uh, and uh, and uh, update the model for a new data set. But it's, mm, and also probably we can release the, the uh, open source version in the future so that you can use your own data set and use it for your purpose. But yeah, this is uh, just a plan now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another question is, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I want to ask uh, what uh, uh, the future direction and or current project for CODH, if you are in position to share, thank you again. Uh, this is from Bianca Chui. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this, mm, this is not 
easy to answer, but well, the, the current project, the, the project that I introduced today is ongoing. So, well, at least uh, this project is not finished. We are continuing this, these projects and uh, probably we will introduce new projects uh, in the future, but it's up to uh, what kind of uh, people we have in, in our group or what kind of collaboration we can have. So it's like up to the future possibilities. So it's not like fixed to plan. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is from Michael Thornton. Um, I was curious to hear more about the full text database uh, you are trying to build. How will you select the text? Okay, that's a good question. I think the, uh, the full text search is for the um, general uh, purpose. So we don't uh, select the uh, <clears throat> Uh, we don't have a, sele a selection policy or correction policy. I think the more important point is that, uh, well, the, the accuracy of the QGIS recognition and uh, full text generation. So it's like, if if it seems to be a low quality, probably we don't include it. And if it seems to be high quality, we include. So it, I think it mo depends more on the quality of the the machine learning rather than the quality of the text. That That's my current idea. Okay, thank you. Um, so we we uh, we get get. Um, thank. Uh, this is from Mr. Kanakamura. Um, thank you for your lecture, uh, Professor Kitamoto. My question is uh, is once you have enough number of data for Kao uh, Kore or Kuzushiji, is it possible to identify the certain artist or scripter when the uh, machine sees a certain faces? or uh, characters? Okay, thank you very much for a good question. I think, yes, uh, many people mm -hmm. ask a similar question like this. And uh, currently our focus is on detecting the object, but not the identify the artists or scripta at, because I think it's, it's not easy to identify the person. It's like, uh, uh, we need a different level of uh, analysis. So, mm. but I, I understand that this has a very important, uh, uh, there, there's a large needs for this purpose. So I want to work on this problem in the future, but not, probably not now, but okay. yes. <laughs> then also uh, a similar question is that how to identify the fake, fake work rather than yeah. the actual work. And that's also oh, a very important problem, but <laughs> it's, it's not easy to do this. So, or well, maybe in the future. Thank you very yes. much. Thank you. It's, it's great to keep hearing feedback, I think, um, you know, what people need and all that kind of thing. Um, so other question is, uh, this is uh, from uh, Daniel Botsman. Uh, those tools are amazing. What do you think the most significant new discovery has been from the development of those remarkable tools? Uh, okay, yeah, it's an important question. I think it's, mm, well, currently, uh, so uh, our tool is to uh, speed up the research of these uh, humanities. Uh, and I think the, uh, well, the next step is that humanities scholars are actually using this tool to have deeper knowledge uh, from <coughs> from the from the data, and that process is well it has just started, so not not uh, like not making a uh, significant progress. And well, I think the the most uh, advanced uh, tool uh, phase is in Kaokore. That actually the art historians are using these tools to understand that how many artists are actually uh, drawing the, those figures or how many groups are drawing these uh, face of, uh, faces. And well, that analysis is done manually by human scholars, but will take advantage of the large data set we create by the triple tools. And uh, yes, so it's like um, relatively currently, it's like a confirmation of the existing knowledge and also uh, extending that knowledge to a little degree. So it's still not remarkable, but uh, I think uh, we are 
making progress toward that direction to make a significant discovery. I think this, this is very important for digital humanities. So we are trying to do this in the future. Yeah, I had a similar question about, uh, you know, like the tools like differential readings and, uh, you know, mm. whatever the people start finding, do you do you leave it, um, leave it open to for other people to see the difference and all the kind of things? Yes, I, I, I want to do this. I want to release it, it as a kind of derived data set from Bukang collection and yes, mm. Actually, for example, uh, one researcher, uh, we are collaborating with one researcher who, who wants to know how the Sankin Kotai period has changed over Edo period. And that kind of data is not available now. So sometimes the daimyo changed the Sankin Kotai season at some year, but we don't know the detail. So we can recreate this data, time series data from the books, and then probably it's a uh, gives more a new knowledge from a big data. So I think we are uh, working on that direction. So, and, and after that, we, we released the, this result uh, as a open date, new open data set. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we have two more questions. Uh, could you talk, uh, <coughs> talk a bit about the Kindai OCR project? Uh, such as, as whether the application is still being updated and whether the whether more modern magazine data are added to train the model. Thank you. Uh, it's from uh, Keia Opan. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't introduce this project, but we have a Kindai OCR project, which is for the OCR for modern modern mean Meiji or Taisho era uh, magazine books and so on. And this is another challenging part with, and it's different from Kuzushiji, but still difficult because of the complexity of the character shapes and also the mm. Ruby and uh, those additional yeah. textual elements, which is quite bad for OCR. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, we are developing, uh, uh, we are developing a version two of these uh, software and also we are now working on creating a new data set and but actually um it's not only our pro our team that is working on this kind of OCR project and actually uh, national data library is currently working on a bigger scale on developing kindai OCR uh, software and they will release open source version by the end of march so this is another project. It's not our project. It's another project. But uh, yeah, it, it's, we are making in Japan. In, in Japan, the, we are making big progress on this software. So maybe you can also refer to the information from National Data Library about this OCR. That's great. Thank you so much. And um, last is the uh, actually it is good closing uh, question, and it's from uh, Professor Danny Boltzmann. Um, uh, if I'm curious to ask a, pre, a personal question, how did you first get into interested in digital humanities? Yeah, thank you for uh, yeah interesting question. And yeah, um, well, in the beginning, uh, for example, the uh, in my current uh, in my PhD work, there's no. Uh, there's no element in digital humanities. So I started the digital humanities research after I started to work in, in NII, uh, National Institute of Informatics. And yeah, I think it's, it's like a coincidence. And uh, yes, because I, well, there was a big uh, digital humanities project uh, called Digital Silk Road. And I was involved in, uh, in a project by, because I was asked from the boss that you should work on this project. So I was involved in this project in that way. So it's not like a plan. Uh, I was asked from the boss and then, but I, I think I, I was a little, uh, I had some knowledge about history and so on because I, I liked it. So, well, uh, I, yeah, at that time, um, not only me, but other people uh, put into this project, but other people left and, I was the only one that is staying 
in was staying in the project. So then I continue this risk. But it's not like uh, uh, sometimes I I was thinking about leaving this document's research <laughs> into other areas. <laughs> but uh, finally, I I keep staying on in the research in this area, and finally I started this center and uh, being more actively involved. That's great. Thank you so much. Again, I really thought, I, I think everybody thought this was very informative and then very um, interesting presentation. Um, thank you so much for all attending and then please welcome, uh, uh, but please thanks again, uh, join me for thanking again, um, uh, Professor Kitamoto. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.